Good afternoon. Welcome to Grade 12 English First Additional Language. Today we are going to start with a series of language lessons that are applicable for Grade 11 and Grade 12. So it's a beautiful day to learn something new. Here we go. We are going to start off with punctuation marks. Now I know this seems unnecessary and simple to you, but it's in every paper and you use punctuation marks incorrectly in all of your writing, your creative writing and transactional writing. So you might as well pay attention. Right, first of all, your full stop. Your full stop is at the end of a full sentence. She kicks the ball and there's a full stop. We use full stops at certain abbreviations as well, but in formal writing, we expect you not to make use of abbreviations. Then we have a comma, a very important punctuation mark, and he has more than one function. First one is two separate words in a series of items. She is clever, comma, motivated. She is a clever, comma, motivated young lady. To enclose extra information, my neighbor, comma, who lives upstairs, comma, is sick. So those words between the commas are the extra information I'm talking about. The comma there can be substituted there with brackets as well. And then to introduce direct quotations that you see with direct speech. He said, comma, inverted commas, I am tired. But the colon can be used in the same way instead of the comma there. Then we have the colon. It's to introduce a series of items, right? You have to bring the following colon, pens, comma, paper, comma, books, pencils. So we see there. The colon introduce a series of items and the comma there separate uh, the words in a series of items. And then the quotation marks, number one, to indicate direct speech. She said, comma, I am sick. Again, the use of the comma there is to in introduce that direct quotation and the quotation marks is her own words within those. And then for direct quotations from a passage, if you are asked to quote, like for instance, in a comprehension test and you have to quote to prove that something is true or false, you put it inside the quotation marks. Yes, to the people who still believes and then to indicate titles of books or films or songs to kill a mockingbird Macbeth all of those will be put inside quotation marks then we have the ellipsis please take note of the spelling if you are asked to identify the underlined punctuation mark and you miss spell the word ellipsis or comma or whatever the case might be, then you will not receive that mark. So ellipsis is usually when omitting or leaving out a word or a line. Today and ellipsis, we voted the bill or to express hesitation or to make the reader think. Right. And then we have a question mark. It is used after direct questions and tags will you go with me and you do care don't you and remember when you do a question tag you don't add the question mark it is incorrect and when your statement is positive your tag is negative and then an exclamation mark is to show emotion emphasis or surprise hooray we won right so people please use these quotation marks correctly when you are writing you're doing your creative writing or transactional writing but in the case of a language paper how is it asked in that test or paper it can either be named the underlined punctuation mark very simple or name the function of the underlined punctuation mark and then you have to name the punctuation mark at the comma and then my friend comma who lives next door comma is sick so my friend is sick who lives next door is the extra information so the commas are used to enclose extra information sometimes they will ask you 
punctuate the following sentence, but that is rarely ever asked. They usually ask you name the underlined punctuation mark or what is the function of the underlined punctuation mark. So you have to know what each punctuation mark is used for. So I only went through a few of them that are asked more frequently. Right, the one that they will always ask and they love to ask, especially in your favorite part of the language paper, correct the single mistake, is the apostrophe. So we're going to do the apostrophe again in detail. Right, so the apostrophe has two main functions. First function is omission. It is to leave something out. So we will, will. She is, she's. He has, he is. So we see there, we will, the W and the I has been left out and substituted with the apostrophe. So it's to contract the word. In other words, you make it shorter. So you leave it out. It is omission. That's the first function. Take note of the spelling of the word omission. If you misspell that, if the question was, what is the function of the apostrophe in this sentence? and you misspelled omission, you will not receive the mark. The next uh, function of the apostrophe is possession. So that is to indicate ownership of something. So the book belongs to Sarah. It is Sarah's book. So you add an apostrophe with an S. Johnson's lost a bag. It is Johnson's bag. Right, look at, he is singular Johnson. You add an apostrophe S, Johnson's bag. All right, then they are going to the house of the boys. Now, a lot of boys, and look where I put the apostrophe. I only added the apostrophe, not the apostrophe S. Why? Because the rule says when a noun is plural and it ends with an S, you only use an apostrophe, not, apostrophe, not the apostrophe S. Like they are going to the house of the boys. It's a lot of boys. My noun is boys. It is plural. It ends with an S. So I only add the apostrophe. All the girls have books. So it's a lot of girls. So my noun, girls, ends on an S, yes. Plural, yes. Only add the apostrophe. You never ever use an apostrophe to make a word plural except for letters and numbers, sevens and t's. For example, you have to mind your p's and q's when you're in the company of the queen. So listen very carefully. You never ever use an apostrophe to make a word plural except for a number or a letter. Otherwise, no plural gets an apostrophe. Remember that. So, rule number one. When a noun is plural and ends with an S, like a lot of girls, plural, ends with an S, girls, only use an apostrophe. So, you only add the apostrophe. Rule number two. It's not technically a rule, but every time you use the apostrophe to make a word plural, a puppy dies. Yes, it is as, as bad as that. So never ever use the apostrophe to make a word plural. Right, so the conclusion, the apostrophe has two functions. So omission, she is, becomes she's. So it's contraction or omission, make sure about the spelling. Then possession, take notes of the four S's. Again, if you misspell those words, you will not receive the mark. So the possession, the girl's hair is long. It's her hair. So the two functions, omission and possession. And the rule, when a noun is plural and ends on an S, you only add the apostrophe, not an apostrophe S like with the others. So there's three things you need to remember. Two functions, one rule. The two functions, omission, you leave something out. She is, she is. And possession, it belongs to her. It's Mary's book. And then the rule, when the noun ends on an S and it's plural, so it's a lot of girls, it's plural, ends on an S, 
you only add the apostrophe, not the apostrophe S. Right, the next thing we're going to look at is synonyms and antonyms. All right, first we need to know what is a synonym. A synonym is a word whose meaning is the same or almost the same to that of another word in the same language. So it's two words with the same meaning, two different words with the same meaning. We call them synonyms. All right, so it's words that have the same or nearly the same meaning. If we have a look at some examples, large and big, tiny and small, happy and content, sad and miserable, funny and humorous, weird and strange. Right, so when you do your writing, your creative writing, instead of saying something was good, you can say it was fantastic or it was praiseworthy or it was brilliant. All right, use a better word. Instead of saying someone is happy, you can say is delighted or exhilarated or thrilled. Or instead of saying there was many things, you can say there was an abundance or an assortment of things. Or I hate it when people say, oh, it was nice. R rather use a word like excellent or agreeable or delightful or charming find another word right okay so that is why we have to know some of the synonyms yes in a comprehension i can ask you provide a synonym for the word happy in line 12 all right but especially with your creative writing try to refrain from using the overused words like a uh, beautiful and big and good and happy instead of beautiful tell me it's uh, drop dead gorgeous or striking instead of big say it's gigantic or massive instead of happy say blissful and cheerful right so try and use concentrate on using synonyms for the overused words that we use every single day. Now we get to an antonym. So what are antonyms? It's words that mean the opposite of each other. So it's words that with as an opposite meaning of the other word. If we have a look at some of the examples, cold and hot opposites smart and stupid, easy and hard, fast and slow, day and night, right and left. Right, again, refrain from using the words that we overuse, all right? So try and use other words. If we look at more antonyms like abundance, the, ab the antonym is scarcity, Compliment will be insult. Interesting is boring. Rare will be common. Real will be imaginary. Reasonable will be excessive. All right, so maybe you should make yourself an antonyms and a synonyms list. Maybe some of you have wonderful teachers that handed you lists like that. Go through them, especially before you write your creative writing paper and before you write your language paper one. Right. Now we get to homonyms and homophones. Okay. First of all, what is a homonym? It is words that are spelled and pronounced in an identical way, but they have different meanings and functions. Words that are spelled and pronounced the same but they have different meanings. And how will this be asked in an exam paper? It will be asked, find a homonym for the word in line 12, say it's the word ball in line 12, and make two sentences that clearly shows the difference between 
the meaning of the two words. All right, so that you will be asked with homonyms and homophones. So let's see. The first one, and I use pictures so that you will remember it. A ball. Now, the first one is obviously a ball that you kick. And the second one is the prince took Cinderella to the ball. So remember, when you have to make a sentence with the homonym ball, then you have to write it out so that the marker can see there's a clear difference in meaning. So the boy kicked the ball or the children played with the ball and the prince took Cinderella to a ball. All right. The next one, fumes. Now, remember, when you are asked to write two sentences about a word, you can't change the word. You can't say the cat is fuming. You have to use the word fumes. All right. So you have to say Sylvester fumes because he's so angry. And then the fumes of the car can be very dangerous. So do not change the word. It must be exactly the same word. Otherwise, you will not receive the mark as well. Right, you can't even change the word into the past tense. That's also incorrect. Then peer. It's not good manners to peer out of the window. No? It's to look uh, out of the window so that nobody see you. Or my peer group is not a good influence on me. Your peer group is the people who are the same age as you are, right? The same interests, etc. That's your peer group. So make very sure your sentence shows the difference in meaning. Then cold. On the first picture, the little boy and the teddy bear both have a cold. They are sick, right? And then the penguin is very cold because it's three below freezing. Then cricket. My mom is so very afraid of a cricket. My dad loves to watch the Pratias play cricket. Make very sure that you make sentences that make sense and that is clearly understandable. I would rather say my mom, the insect my mom is the most afraid of is a cricket. And I will say my dad loves to watch the Pratias play cricket on a Saturday afternoon. Then we get to homophones. It's words that are pronounced in the same way, but differ in spelling and meaning. So they are pronounced the same, but they're not spelled the same and they don't have the same meaning. So I always say, how do I remember this? If I hear it, it sounds the same, but if I look at it, it looks it doesn't look the same. So what do I do? I hear with my ear and I put a telephone next to my ear, homophone. So make that connection. It's only, it sounds the same. You listen over the phone, right? It sounds the same, but it doesn't look the same and it does not mean the same. Remember the connection with phone, all right? So there's a perfect example of aloud and aloud. If you say the words out loud, it sounds the same, but it's not spelled the same and it definitely has not the same meaning. And remember, you must make clear sentences with the correct spelling of the word in that applicable sentence. So the first one, the aloud, A-L-O-U-D, he does not like to read aloud in front of the class. All right, that is out loud. Okay, so and then aloud, you are permitted to, that's the second one with the W, there are dogs allowed in the park next to our house. If you switch the two around and you give the wrong word in the wrong sentence, you will obviously not receive your marks. All right, do not write the two words in one sentence. Okay, make two. 
different sentences. Read your instructions. If the instruction says, write down two sentences to show the meaning of the homophone of allowed, then you must think the homophone, it sounds the same, but it doesn't look the same and it doesn't mean the same. So then you must think about the homophone allowed with the W and you make two separate sentences. He does not like to read aloud in the front of the class and there are dogs allowed in the park next to our house. Right, the next one they love to ask, I've seen this in a lot of papers, is they will give you the word flower, the first one, the pink one, and they ask you, make a sentence with the homophone of the word flower. Then you have to make a sentence with the second word. Right, so your first sentence will maybe be, I gave my mother a beautiful flower for Mother's Day. That's the first one, the one with the petals. And then the second one, the white thingy, the fluffy stuff. The flour is one of the ingredients I use to bake a cake. Right, and obviously this will be asked in your language part of your paper one. And spelling does count. So make very sure of the spelling of your two homophones. And make very sure your two sentences shows a clear difference that you understand the difference of these two words when you write them down. New and new. Right, it sounds the same, but it does not look the same and it does not mean the same. In the first slide, you all can all see this is new. It's something that you have not had. You've re just received it. So I received a brand new car for my 18th birthday. Whoop, whoop. Right, and then new. I knew I could succeed if I just tried hard enough. The second one is the past tense of no. All right. To know something yesterday, I knew something. Okay. Be very sure the meaning of the words comes out in your sentences that you write down. Right. Then, second last one is meat and meat. So the first one, obviously, my father buys meat at the butchery. And the second one, I'm always nervous when I meet new people. And then the egg yolk is the first one. You see the broken egg. And then the yolk, the one, the, the yolk in the second picture is that wooden thing that is on oxen's necks. And it is used to manipulate and to order them around, to control them, all right, to make them go in the direction you want to. So make very sure about the spelling of the first one as well, yoke with an L, but it's a silent L, all right, and the second one has an E at the end. Okay, so a sentence for the first one would probably be, the egg yolk contains most of the known vitamins with the exception of vitamin C. And then your second one will be the herd boys put the yoke on the oxen's necks to show them which direction to go. So it's something to restrain animals, right? So make very sure that in these sentences, the meaning of your words that you can show the marker, you know exactly what the meaning of your words are and follow the instructions to the letter of the law. If you're asked to write down one word, write down only one word. If you're asked to write two sentences, write two sentences. If you're asked to quote consecutively, remember it is following after one another. If you are asked to quote separately, you can know it's separate, it's separate places in the passage. Right. So let's see. The homonyms are the words that are spelled and pronounced in an identical way, but they have different meanings. All right. 
The homophones are words that are pronounced in the same way, but they don't look the same. So it's different in spelling and in meaning. Remember the connotation that we make with your phone, you listen over your phone, you hear. So it only sounds the same, but it doesn't look the same and it doesn't have the same meaning. Then the synonyms are the words with similar meanings and the antonyms are words with opposite meanings. Now, if you look at homonyms and homophones, it deals mainly with spelling and pronunciation and the synonyms and antonyms are words with opposite meanings. Right, so this concludes the language aspects that I wanted to do with you today. I know you think it's simple and you've known it since you were in grade eight, but they keep on asking it and you keep on making mistakes. So there's no harm in revising the basics so that you can be sure that when you get a question in your exam paper, whether it be to correct the mistake or whether it be to give provide a synonym or an antonym or make sentences to show the difference between the two homonyms, then you are sure about what is going on. This brings us to the end of our lesson. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. I will see you all again tomorrow. Have a great afternoon. Stay safe. Make wise choices. Goodbye.